we get the engine started on today's Mobile One The Grid with the inside track on Porsche Prowess in GT Racing. A highly skilled support team keeps Porsche's Factory World Endurance Championship campaign firmly on track and, just as importantly, provides customer teams wearing the Stuttgart badge with the means to win. Beside us, factory team, we also have a customer support crew. I would say about five people, performance engineer, engine engineer, systems engineer. We started motorsport as a customer racing thing because all the Porsches in the past, the first 356, also the 917, the cars which won at the beginning were customer cars. So customer racing is DNA of Porsche and a very important tradition. A huge support program provides technical assistance, parts and even works drivers to customer teams and in the IMSA series, Porsche Motorsport North America run the show. Depending on the race series we are running, there are different levels of support. Our, our principle is always that we treat every customer equally. And of course, if you want to run the big shows or run for the overall wins, then we give additional support with the drivers and also performance support. The support is crucial to customer squads competing in both IMSA and the WEC, and the provision of factory drivers to these teams is key to their success. The factory driver represents Porsche around the world. Um, there is Porsche drivers who are given to good customer teams, and it's basically to improve the team and get the information to Porsche and then be successful together. Then there is four Porsche factory drivers who are actually in the Porsche factory team. Alongside the factory squad, four customer 911 RSRs compete in the WEC GTE AM class, keeping works drivers and support crew pretty busy. We run the 911 RSR, so you need about 35 people. Uh, mechanics, tire mechanics, logistics, truck drivers, the engineers, management and for sure the drivers. The customers' teams need to be on a quite good level because it's a, a GTE car, so more sophisticated than a GT3 car. One team which we work with is Proton and a new team three or four years ago was Project One. But these guys were running cup cars, so they have experience in us, but for sure we look that they're not motorsport beginners coming to us to run the car. In North America, teams like reigning IMSA GTD champions FAF Motorsport represent the success of Porsche's strategy. FAF Motorsport was running in the Sprint Challenge before, they were running in cup cars, and now they won last year the, the IMSA championship in GTD, and that's the normal way with a Porsche customer team. They don't come out of nowhere, they're always within our family for a longer time, and then they step up the pyramid. Customer teams are important to the German mark, as witnessed at Sebring in March when the WEC 1000 miles and the IMSA Mobile One 12 hours took place on the same weekend. It's a big show. We have a very growing field. We have the Carrera Cup here in the IMSA paddock with 43 entries of new 992 Cup cars. Nine GT4 RS Club Sport are running in the Michelin Pilot Challenge. And then four GT3R are running in the IMSA field. In the WEC you have the customer classes, the M classes and the pro classes, so the factory team classes. And we are competing in the factory class against Ferrari and Corvette. And therefore it's very important that we are there and show also on the racetrack that we are probably the best manufacturer out there. Keeping the Stuttgart badge at the front of the grid is the aim. And with Porsche support, customer teams are flying high alongside their factory counterparts. Porsche is proud that we service the customers and bring them to a level that they can win these big shows. It's not a factory team winning, it's a customer team winning. And that is, I think, a more difficult task. Rallying now as we join world champions Toyota on test in Croatia. With round three of the WRC coming up, Toyota Gazoo Racing were busy in pre-event testing prior to the Yaris Rally 1's first outing on the challenging tarmac of Rally Croatia. We tend to test in the rally area before every European event. We're allowed basically one day per driver for our pre-event testing, so this is our, our chance to to sample the car on roads similar to that we'll drive on the rallies. Testing is always important. You need to be really spot on with the setup and the car to be really fast in the rallies. Croatia has been done only once in the championship and we don't have much experience. So it's important now to have the car really good and, and comfortable for us. Being only the WRC's second visit to Croatia and a first for the new Rally 1 hybrid cars meant an early start for the TGR crews. One hour, one and a half hours before we start to drive the rally car, we do this recce. So we go through the road and Kalle is saying, face notes to me, I'm riding them down. 
And second time I'm reading him the notes and he's making the corrections. We do two passes like we would on an event. And then we just do that in the rental car because we're doing it slow speed anyway. So make the notes and then basically hop into the car and start reading the pace notes like I would on the rally. Sebastian Ogier drove the number four Yaris in Monte Carlo. So for SFK Lappi, the test was a first chance to experience the car on tarmac. On this surface, you, you really understand how much extra power you have with the hybrid boost and how impressive the acceleration actually is. It is really a huge kick coming. And on the wide road, it's fine. But on the small road, sometimes a bit, a bit too much. Rally Croatia's varying, often damaged tarmac stages meant finding the right setup for the Yaris's suspension would be a real challenge. The engineers, they have a quite a detailed plan. They'll work with the driver. There'll be some new dampers to try. There'll be some new geometries to try. They have a plan worked out pretty much before we start the day. Finding the best engine power settings or maps is also key to giving the crews the best chance of victory. I believe guys did already a good job in Monte Carlo. How to deploy the power on the tarmac. We've done some adjustments after that. And I believe we have gone to the right direction. I'm, I'm sure we are on the right way. With telemetry data, engineers can evaluate the performance of the Yaris. But for the crews, there's a lot more to think about before they arrive at the rally itself. The driver, when it comes to testing, they have to be a good sensor and give really quite accurate feedback but also have an open mind that on a rally you can be on the wrong tyre or the wrong setup if the weather changes when you're away from service park. You have to adapt as much as possible, so it's important to try and predict where you might be caught out on an event and really try and work on it here on testing. At Rally Croatia the following weekend, the preparation paid off when Toyota's young Finn delivered a stunning final stage victory to extend his championship lead. Normally the feeling when the car is good, you just drive and enjoy. You don't need to really do anything special with the car. It works, it turns well, it doesn't oversteer or understeer. That is the main thing what you always want from the car. Next up we meet a driver who's busy competing in two series on very different racetracks. Canadian driver Stuart Friesen races all over North America in two different types of car on two different surfaces. He's a regular winner in both. This is my sixth year uh, in the Cayman World Truck Series, uh, driving the 52 for Helmar Friesen Racing. And uh, we're here in Daytona. On top of that, we run 50 to 70 dirt modified races all across the Northeast and East Coast. So we get really busy this time of year. In the Truck Series, 38-year-old Friesen is up against a mix of veterans and rookies on their way up the NASCAR ladder. Now in his third year with Toyota, he's hoping to improve on his sixth place finish in 2021. When we started in the Truck Series in 2016, you could run a top 10 and, and still be off a little bit. Now there's 20 to 25 teams here that are capable of winning week in and week out. You got some young kids that are fresh, and then there's a few of us, you know, myself, Johnny Sauter, Crafton, that have been around a couple years in the Truck Series. Ben Rhodes, you know, we've been running trucks together for five years, and it's a little different. There's some skills and tricks you know going to different tracks that the rookies really don't know yet, so that kind of helps. It's like youth and enthusiasm versus old age and treachery. So sometimes it's youth and enthusiasm, sometimes uh, the old guys went out. Daytona week is especially busy for Friesen as he's also racing his dirt modified down the road in the Dirt Car Nationals. Super Dirt Car Series Big Block Modified, so they're purpose-built dirt track, oval track stock cars. We run them mainly in the Northeast, New York, Ontario, but it's, it's on the grow. We run with the Short Track Super Series as well. We're into Louisiana now. We run Florida, South Carolina. I grew up in Big Block Modified racing, and I've been lucky enough to, to make a living at it the last 10 years or so. I had a lot of great car owners, and that's what we do on, on top of the truck stuff. With Truck Series practice and a dirt modified race on the same evening, Friesen relies on his dirt car crew to ready his car for Lucia while he is on the track at Daytona in his Toyota Tundra. With the truck practice going from 5 till just about 6 o'clock, practice starts at Volusia at 6 o'clock and it's about a 40 minute drive. So we're going to jump out of the truck and just hightail it up the road uh, to Volusia and hopefully make it in time for time trials. If not, we'll tag the back of a heat race and, and try to get qualified and do the best we can over there. The scramble to get from Daytona to Volusia Speedway Park wouldn't be for everyone, but Friesen takes it all in his stride, arriving too late for qualifying, but hoping to get through from the back of his heat to the feature race. Busted ass to get over here, and we just missed time trials, so by like five minutes. So we'll, uh, we'll start in the back of the third heat. I think it's like 10 cars in a the heat. They, they qualify five, so hopefully we can get up through there and get in the show. 
Sure enough, Friesen does make the feature race, thanks to his crew giving him a great race car that he could just hop into. We got such a good group of guys. Tommy Conroy leads the dirt crew and does a great job, and that's what it takes. Well, you got to have a good team uh, around you, and um, you know, I, I believe we got the best here. It wasn't his night in the feature race, but having won two days earlier, it had been a successful week on the Volusia dirt. Back on the asphalt the next day, Friesen finished 16th in a wild truck race that saw half the field wreck at the end. Since then, he's regularly been inside the top 10, switching cars and surfaces, continuing to make him a better driver. They're two totally different animals, but it's really cool. It's neat to be able to do both, and I think it helps my skill set keep me sharper as a driver doing different stuff. Great golfers play every day. I believe it's the same with racing. Uh, the more you do it, the, the better you can be, and then the more keen your, your skill set gets to be. NHRA Drag Racing now as we join Coletta Motorsports for a top fuel teardown. A top fuel dragster can reach speeds of 335 miles per hour in 3.6 seconds over the 400 meter pass. The strain on the car means everything must be checked and repaired or replaced between runs. There are certain things with this engine, 11,000 horsepower, running it that hard, uh, that short a distance that you just have to look at, which are the mainline bearings and the, the pistons and the rods, and then the clutch. So it's cool to watch. Right when the car gets back into the pits, car gets on the jack, belly pads come off, then I start ripping the clutch out. So meanwhile, we got eight guys tearing this thing apart at all times. Uh, blower head guy, two cylinder head guys, two clutch guys, bottom end guy, and a rod and piston guy. As far as the clutch stuff, it's really, really hot. You're looking at nine to a thousand degrees. We're checking the wear on the disc. Uh, I go inside with the clutch, set stall, make sure the levers are okay, make sure everything's tight, double checking the weight, putting a fresh pack in, fresh flywheel back in that's resurfaced, that's completely flat. The clutch is really, really important. Meanwhile, while everybody's doing that, and he's servicing the bottom end, what he's checking, he's checking the crank. Look in the camera real quick, making sure the lobes look good. As far as the crank goes, making sure our bearing's not spun, then a fresh rack comes in and the motor's good. The cylinder heads, what they're doing is they're ripping the headers off, they're leaking down the springs, making sure the pressure's good. Nitromethane is so combustible and the valve train, 8,000 RPM, it gets really, really violent. You can break a spring, break a valve, and it can blow up. The blower, what we check is it's a high helix blower and we're measuring rotor to case clearance, making sure it's not too loose. As far as the rat guy goes, they're making sure the rings aren't pinched, measuring the sink of the piston, measuring the rod. Feel-wise too, there's a certain percent that we run. We get a new guy, he doesn't start off doing clutch. Could he do it? Absolutely. But those are really, really big jobs. We'll start them off the bases, rods and pistons, clutch assisting. Get familiar with the car when we practice at the shop. We do a simulated teardown. We'll bolt it all the way back up. All right, tear it down as fast as you can. We did it in seven minutes. Well, let's try to do it in five. Testing is the organized chaos, and race day is you start dropping stuff, and a new guy will practice at the shop just so we're on beat, up to par. When that car fires up, and it does a burnout, and it backs up, our jobs are done. Then it's on Doug. Doug, unbelievable driver. He has got thousands and thousands of runs down this thing. I look at that car, and I look at all the guys behind me, and they're just as thrilled as me. We're all doing our jobs, we're doing it good. Could we get better? Absolutely. But this year, look out. We end today with NASCAR as we meet SHR Young Guns, Cole Custer and Chase Briscoe. Stuart Haas Racing added a rookie to their roster both in 2020 and 2021. They've been on a steep learning curve in the Cup Series, especially with the challenges of last year. I don't think it was a season anybody wanted, you know, SHR. Um, we were definitely down in all aspects, but this is the year where we want to hit back and we want to prove what we can do. SHR, it's a winning organization and we need to get back to that. So we're putting all we got into this next gen car. We're working hard to figure it out and it's just a matter of executing when we get there. There's not really a ton we can take away from last year. Not that we rode off last year completely, but I guess we put a little more of our chips in the basket towards the next gen car and trying to focus on that. So I do think that that'll hopefully help us out. I do feel like we're in a good place when it comes to the next gen car and Hopefully our bad experience last year will help us for this year. It's certainly done that. 
Briscoe made a piece of history for himself and the sport at the fourth race of the season in Phoenix. Driving for his boyhood idol, Tony Stewart, Chase Briscoe becomes the 200th winner in the history of the NASCAR Cup Series. With the win, Briscoe cemented his place in this year's playoffs, while Custer got his first taste of victory lane two years earlier at Kentucky. Winning in NASCAR is what you dreamed of as a kid. I remember when I was five years old, I never thought I would ever win a cup race. So being able to win now, it's amazing to have that feeling when you cross the line and all the work that's gone into it, all the people that have helped you get there. I mean, it's a huge moment in your life when you feel like you've, you've accomplished what you want to. As the young guns at SHR, Custer and Briscoe may be judged against each other, but it doesn't feel that way, either at the racetrack or away from it. Cole's probably the, the one person I've been the closest to for a while. Ever since I've moved down here, he was one of the first people I met. And you know, we came through the Xfinity Series together. He moved up a year before I did. So I've always kind of bounced ideas off of him. Cole is definitely the guy I talk to the most. You know, I talk to Kevin and Eric a lot as well. But Cole's been a huge help if I have a question about, hey, should the car be doing this, car be doing that, just because we are so relatable and experienced. We've been friends and kind of raced together for you know probably six or seven years now. I mean, I think it's cool to kind of have that guy that you're comfortable with and you can bounce ideas off of driving-wise and just things that have worked for your car. So it's definitely been a, a cool relationship and being able to work with each other on the track and also staying a little bit competitive also. You know? So it's definitely cool to be racing with your friends out there. The pair also have solid working relationships with their crew chiefs, Mike Shiplett for Custer and Johnny Klausmeyer for Briscoe, who helped guide him to Rookie of the Year last season. Anytime you get any type of accolade, it's good. It helps your confidence. Um, obviously, that was that was a goal uh, for for us starting the season last year. But the bar constantly raises, and he pushes himself. We push ourselves as a team. We know that last year was a learning year. It was a rookie year. This year, the bar has to raise, and we've set higher goals for ourselves. Johnny and me, I feel like, are very similar when it comes to demeanor. We're both really, really laid back. We're definitely on the calmer side of things. He hasn't really worked with the sprint car guy before, so it just took us a little bit. But now, you know, me and Johnny, Johnny, I think, have done a really good job of kind of figuring out that foundation that we need and hopefully can build it up into something special. I think this is me and Mike's fourth year together, so it's been a great time. I've won a lot of races in Xfinity, won a cup race, so I think it's just a matter of, you know, we already have that relationship, so I think we can just keep building and building, and I think that's going to lend well going into this new car. From his first season to his second season, he's learned a lot. I think the team's grown a lot, and we just need to keep building and moving forward with this new car because everybody's on a clean slate now. The rules in the car are going more into the style of racing that he grew up doing, and I think that's going to benefit him a lot more this year. With Kevin Harvick and Eric Almarola at the other end of their careers, the drivers of the 41 and 14 hope to lead a bright future for SHR. They may share the same numbers, but they're just a little different. Cole likes the car a little bit tighter than I do for sure. I come from a dirt background where Cole's is a little more pavement, but I would say that Cole drives more off the right front tire where I'm kind of more off the right rear and slipping and sliding around a little bit more. But I think we both look for kind of the same feel, just different types of ways to get there. Next time, why nothing beats them all for Porsche. And what keeps Kevin Harvick buzzing at 46. We'll see you then on Mobile One The Grid.